So today we're talking about the lesion deficit method, a way of studying the brain and what it does. Now, Brokaw worked with patients who had what's known as an aphasia, and what he noticed is that all of these patients had damage to a particular part of their brain, the left inferior frontal gyrus. So what does this tell us? Well, clearly it has something I'm to not do remember any with of this. language production. Memory is powerful. It connects the events of our lives into a meaningful, coherent story. Without memory, we wouldn't be able to learn and may never develop a sense of self. But memory is fragile. I forget things all the time, and there's so much from the story of my own life that's been lost forever. That's why I'm taking a trip into my own brain to find out how my memories are formed, how they're stored, and why there's so much I can't seem to remember. The journey starts with the senses. The truth is that most of what we experience in our daily lives is lost before it ever has the chance to become a memory. This is the primary visual cortex. These neurons are the buffer that holds all the visual input from my eyes, everything that I see. Every day we're bombarded with an ocean of sensory data, an endless jumble of noise absorbed by the senses. That might sound overwhelming, but the mind quickly decides what's important and jettisons the rest. The vast majority will be lost within a single second. In the next phase of our journey, this chosen data from my senses will advance to the next buffer, my working memory. We'll take this lower route through the temporal lobe. This is where visual information is translated into words and concepts. We are headed to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. This is where information is held for the short term. Working memory is very limited, and anything held in working memory will decay and disappear in a matter of minutes. Forgotten. The only way to keep information from disappearing forever is to use it. Repeating it, thinking about it, keeping it refreshed in the buffer. But this isn't the end of the journey. Information can be sent from working memory to a structure deep within the brain, where it can be stored as a permanent memory. We are right below the hippocampus now, in the interior of the brain. The process of transferring data from your working memory to your long-term storage happens here. Information from across the brain is pulled together and bound into new memories. This is where learning takes place. From the hippocampus, memories can be sent to different parts of the brain for long-term storage, but we know at least some are stored in the medial temporal lobe. Here we can find small networks of connected neurons that encode individual memories. Here's a circuit that activates anytime I see my friend, Shannon. These neurons don't just store the image of her face, they also These activate when I hear her voice or read her name. Part of their this circuit the encodes the concept knowledge. of Shannon. This is my knowledge about the world, compressed into tiny closed loops in my brain. Isn't that amazing? But what happens when I try to remember something and fail? What happens when I forget? There's been a lot of debate about whether long-term memories are ever truly erased. Maybe I don't actually lose memories. Maybe I just can't find them. To access memories, you need a pathway to the neural circuit that stores that memory. Those pathways are formed by the context of what you experienced when the memory was formed in the first place, and they're strengthened and reformed every time you access that memory in the future. This may explain why something like a familiar smell can propel me into the past suddenly unlocking some long-forgotten memory. It's just the right cue to ignite a dormant neural pathway. There's a lot that can cause the brain to forget. When we gain new memories, our neurons change. They grow and make new connections. They might become more or less active. Molecules can change how neurons communicate with each other. And similar changes can reverse this process and cause memories to weaken or disappear. In fact, the brain seems to be constantly engaged in a tug-of-war between forming and strengthening memories and weakening or even destroying them. An endless battle between remembering and forgetting. Forgetting something important feels awful. It feels like failure. But as strange as it may sound, there may be a benefit to forgetting. Computer models have shown that perfect memory does not equal perfect learning. Learning to navigate or search can actually improve when up to 80% of knowledge is randomly lost. Random forgetting can also improve communication and help us learn complex patterns. Forgetting isn't failure. The brain is designed to forget. There's still a lot we don't know about the brain structures responsible for storing and retrieving memories, but this journey into my brain has helped me understand my own memory and why I'm so forgetful. Human memory isn't perfect, it's unreliable. Memories fade and memories fail, but this isn't an accident, and I don't think we should consider it a failure. Memory is excellent at what it does, storing and retrieving relevant information that helps us understand the world. To think is to forget a difference, to generalize, to abstract. Without that ability, we might be so overwhelmed by irrelevant details that we never manage to learn or understand anything at all.